Welcome back, sisters. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Alhamdulillah, so um, this halaqa is on the foundations of the spiritual path, which is a PDF. How many of you have the access to the PDF? Okay, so some of you do not have it. I'm going to ask Mary, <laughs> my my tech support here, inshallah. She, if you can, if you have an iPhone, um, easiest thing to do is to turn on your um, air airdrop so that she can quickly just send it to whoever, and then hopefully you guys can share uh, amongst each other. But if you want to uh, also look it up, you can do that as well. Just do a quick Google um, for. Uh, foundations of the spiritual path and then put in the word sandala and you're going to get the uh, sa sandala website and then it's the second or third article in that list but um, it's a really uh, just I think uh, such a critical work that all of us can benefit from and you can keep reviewing it I've read it countless times I've benefited every single time because we evolve, we change, life changes, you know, there's things that happen in our lives. So we might find ourselves in a different place than we were even a month ago, right? Or, um, you know, a year ago or whatever. So every time you review it, you'll find maybe new realizations. So, but this is um, a text that I think, especially now that we're in Rajab, inshallah, Ramadan is around the corner. I think it's really important to review. Uh, the other day, I, just for my own curiosity, I put up a post on Instagram asking people ahead of Ramadan, what are they most worried about? You know, what are the things that we're most concerned about? Um, and the options were, you know, getting our prayers on time, uh, reconnecting with the Book of Allah uh, for the sisters, making up our missed fasts. Um, and then there are a couple more options. Uh, but I, I was trying to just assess where are people you know, most worried, what are they thinking about the most? And I know it's been obviously a very, very difficult time for our ummah, um, the hearts are, are broken. And you can tell, you know, I'm sure when you go out, you don't feel the same. I, f I feel it, I sense it. Our hearts are heavy, we're, we're feeling the weight of uncertainty, the weight of grief, you know, trauma. Uh, maybe you, you feel like a zombie, you know, walking around, I, you know, at work, at school, um, shopping, you just don't feel that you're in a good place, and I think that's a collective, um, it's certainly a collective sentiment that we're all feeling. But we need to move on as, as we're always reminded that we have to still live, we have to still continue. So Ramadan is, as I said, around the corner, and that means we have to start planting the seeds, right? Rajab is the month of planting, and then, you know, the, the, the springs, inshallah, of Shaban will come, and then we harvest inshallah in the month of Ramadan. That's our hope, right? So that means good habit formation right now. That means if your prayers, you know, aren't, um, you're not doing your five prayers on time or doing them at all, this is the time right now to take it really seriously. And if there's ever a time that we should be really, really um, focused on, on perfecting our prayers, it's right now because, you know, if not for ourselves, you know, this is the interesting thing about the human being. And I think a lot of us who are um, in the, in, in some capacity serving, right? Whether you're a daughter or you're a son for maybe those who are watching online or you're uh, a husband or a wife or, um, you know, a, a spouse or a mother, a father, we're serving. And so when you're serving, you tend to not really think of yourself because that's the nature of service. So you're, you're not a priority. Um, and even spiritually, that can be true. There are people, I guarantee you, who are very good at service in the community. I can guarantee you there are people who are active in their masjid. They may be teaching in their masjid. They may be um, doing good works, you know, the people, but for themselves, for their own spiritual uh, well-being, they're not, they're not taking care of themselves. So that means potentially missing their prayers, you know, and you can you can have that. I mean, it's it sounds kind of odd, right? Because you're thinking, wouldn't that be a priority? But the nafs is very interesting. You know, the nafs can delude you into doing things, thinking that you're getting you're getting all this reward, not realizing that you're neglecting something far more important. And then, of course, shaitan is also part of that process. That's his whole objective: is to thwart us, to deter us from doing 
good work by preoccupying us with lesser work. And that's actually something that most people don't think about. Like Iblis, Iblis is not just uh, one to incite us or entice us to evil. He will do that for sure when the opportunity presents him itself, but he also um, derails our good works, right? So that's what that is. It's like getting you to do a lesser, a, good, a deed of lesser value so that you don't do a deed of, of greater value. So if you're serving anybody and, and you're doing it for fi sabid Allah, but you're neglecting your own soul, then this is absolutely the time to wake up and say, what am I doing? I have to prioritize myself because just like we enter the world alone, we're going to leave the world alone and be buried alone. Most of us will be buried alone and we'll be raised to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So we can't depend on others to save us if we're not even invested in our own salvation. So what does investing in your own salvation means? It means getting your own house in order, spiritual house in order. And this is the beauty of the, the blessing of being able to witness the ushering of these months that come before Ramadan is that it gives you time to do that. So this document, um, which I hope all of you have by now, and those of you who are watching on YouTube, by the way, if you go into the description of the uh, link, the PDF is there. So you can just grab the PDF from the description. But you know, the, this is the fourth session that we've had. And because of some interruptions with the schedule, I, I kind of spend a little bit of time reviewing what we've already covered so that nobody feels kind of lost. So I'm going to try as quickly as I can to review what we've covered in the first three sessions and then bring us back to where we are for to today's session. So if you look at the document, first of all, what is this? It's called The Foundations of the Spiritual Path, and this is by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, who is a 15th century or 9th century uh, Hijri um, scholar. He's uh, considered a mujaddid of his time. Um, he is uh, referred to as Muhtasab uh, al-Awliya wal-Ulama, or Ulama wal-Awliya, which is the regulator of the scholars and the saints. So he has a very... Uh, I mean, vast, vast, uh, mashallah, knowledge in many different areas. But he gave us this incredible, um, you know, uh, knowledge in this in this document called the Foundations, where he basically gives you a roadmap for you to be on a spiritual path. What you need, right? What are what are, what does it need? What are the criteria? What are the um, points that you need to focus on in order for you to really invest in yourself? So he starts us off by saying that the foundations of the path are five. The first is that you have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he clarifies in a, you know, what that means in, by saying that it's mindfulness of Allah, which we know, but it's also consistency with that. So both in private and in public, that you are a person that really thinks of your Lord, that you try your hardest to think of him, that he's not someone you run from or that you don't want to think about, right? Because people who are engrossed in sin, the last one they want to think about is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, you know, just like when you're, uh, you know, doing things you shouldn't be doing as a child, you don't want to think about your parents or teachers or adults, you want to get away with it. So we, we try to remove uh, the thought of Allah when we're immersed in sin. But the opposite is true for people who want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're always looking to try to bring him into your mind. And that means uh, making connections. You know, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but it is a deliberate exercise. If you're doing something that you think is mundane, why? Why are you wasting your time doing something mundane? Why not have a reframe of whatever it is you're doing and make it an act of, of a ibadah, right? If you're frustrated because you feel like, oh, all day long I, I waste my time, well, maybe that's because you haven't found a creative way to convert what you're doing into something beneficial. So a lot of us, especially as women, when we're staying home with our children, we may feel that way, you know, when we feel like we're not being productive because we're comparing our lives to people outside the home and thinking, oh, we're just, you know, living these mundane, boring lives at home, taking, you know, doing housework, the drudgery of housework. That's all waswasa. It's all a way of shaitan to uh, steal from you. And what does he steal? He's the ultimate thief. What does he steal? He steals our time, 
right? Because now, instead of being in a state of, how can I take this action or this deed that I'm doing, maybe I'm doing a chore, I'm washing dishes, I'm folding laundry, I'm, I'm dusting, I'm doing something that is maybe not the most exciting thing to do or fun thing to do, but I'm going to convert it into an opportunity to bring barakah and light into my home, right? I'm, I'm, to bring barakah and light into my being, because with every word of dhikr that we do, we are, inshallah, washing our bodies, cleansing our bodies from the filth of the sins that we've accumulated. Our good deeds are increasing, right? The spots that we know, you know, according to the hadith, of sins that have accumulated on the heart due to excessive sins, right? Uh, the spots, excuse me, that are accumulating on the heart, that those are being, you know, removed, polished away with dhikr, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a matter of just having that, that frame of mind that says, I refuse to, to let opportunity slip me by. Um, and I recently watched, um, watched a video. Someone was mentioning, I don't know who she was, but it was just one of these, you know, reels or whatever it was. And she was saying, there's something called, I think it's called the red car phenomenon. And so she, uh, she was explained that if I asked you, any, any of you right now, how many red cars did you see? Uh, today coming here, right? Does anybody, does anybody drive a red car? <laughs> Maybe you have a red car. So one person, okay? But the rest of you, do you, could you count right now how many red cars you saw? It was also dark, right? But let's just say today, right? Um, there are things that until you're thinking of them, you're not going to recognize them or realize them, right? So her point was, now if I told you that for every red car you see, you're going to get like a certain reward, $50 or $100. Trust me, you're going to look. You are going to look for red cars everywhere you go because now we've attached a reward system to the, pro to the process, right? So opportunities, the point of the video was opportunities are like red cars that if you don't pay attention to them, you don't notice them. But once you pay attention, then you will notice and then take advantage of them. So time any time you have that you're not actually doing something that really takes your concentration is an opportunity for dhikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Driving a vehicle is a great time to uh, maximize your dhikr of Allah. Like it's not, it shouldn't, I mean, you're, you we're in a kind of a hypnotic state anyway we're in a, when we're in a car, but this is a great opportunity to not just do dhikr of Allah, but also to do munajat, right? Which is what? when you converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is real. Like, you, we should be talking to Allah. And it's, a, it's, a, it's not a one-way conversation, even though it's one directional in, in the activity of it, right? But it is absolutely, in your mind, it should be a two-way conversation in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything. And he, he says that those who call on me, I will respond, right? So when we call on him, he will respond in his time. But to take those times to just be like, Ya Allah, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm sorry for being this person who keeps failing. I'm sorry for not um, doing what I should be doing. You know, whatever you feel like you need to purge. Um, or just, you know, appreciating his bounties, you know. Ya Allah, thank you. I, I don't deserve, or, you know, we should. We should feel undeserving because we are. We, we sin, we're forgetful, but he is so generous. So bringing that, um, all of that out is a beautiful time to do that it, when you're home alone, when you're in the car. So when we say taqwa, mindfulness of Allah, it shouldn't look like something that's difficult to do, but something you look forward to, you know? Like I want to... I'm going to bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into my, my mind because what better thing is there to think about? There's nothing better. Like there's really nothing better. Everything you think about um, compared to thinking of your Lord will not yield in, in, in anything uh, you know, positive as much as obviously they can. So you know, just trying that as a practice. And then he goes on to say, so that's the first foundation of the path. Then adherence to the sunnah and word and deed. So being people that really take your, the, the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seriously. You know, uh, you know, I have, um, I, don't, I didn't bring the book with me, but we're going to be doing it, inshallah. Uh, next week, I'll be in, inshallah, inshallah, if it all works out, I'll be in Texas, where we're going to be doing, um, with Celebrate Mercy, the content of character. This is an incredible uh, text. You know, Shaykh Hamza, mashallah, he's given us quite a, 
a few uh, works that are really important, the Purification of the Heart, Agenda, which has the foundations in it, by the way, um, and then Content of Character. And the Content of Character is, is a Hadith book collection all on character development, how to be more like the Prophet Sallallahu And it's incredible. I mean, it's a, over 100, uh, maybe close to 120, 130 Hadith. It's very, um, you know, random, but it's it's something that if you read and you start to put into practice, you're going to see yourself evolve into a better human being. So sometimes we need to take these practices, you know, to that level. We can't just, you know, uh, hear a hadith here and there and appreciate them and maybe know them, but a application is really what we're talking about here. So adherence to the sunnah and word indeed is knowing the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and putting it into practice consistently. And then indifference to whether others accept or reject one. This is a really important, again, point because true faith is... Um, is, is uh, something that's going to be tested in many ways, right? And when you're living in a time of, of, uh, of uh, godlessness, there are a lot of people that are just not religious. They don't feel religion is of value at all. You are a minority in the world, right? We are. Uh, although, you know, you can look at, um, you know, the population and there's all these, uh, you know, um, uh, polls that are done and, and people reveal their religious beliefs, but really when you look at practice of faith um, Unfortunately, we are living in a really uh, just dark time where a lot of people are just not taking their faith or faith at all seriously So we're going to have to deal with that and how do we do that? Well, the best way is to not really care that you know, the Prophet told us that Islam started as something strange and it's going to end as something strange. So, you know, you have to kind of accept that you are going to not always fit in and people are going to find you to be, whether it's in your family or outside of your family, right? Some of us may have, may deal with that in our own families, right? That people find us to be, you know, dif different and they treat us differently because we are uh, committed to our faith. But that's okay because when you're seeking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure, it doesn't matter if people accept you or reject you. You truly don't care because you are accepted by the only one that matters. So it's just a whole mindset of, of um, not feeling like you need to uh, acquiesce or fit into other people's um, little boxes, but rather, uh, you know, practice your faith freely and be content with the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you. So whatever others think of you just doesn't matter. And then contentment with Allah in times of both hardship and ease. Uh, this is just a rida, you know, everything is from Allah, our, our tests, our trials, as well as our blessings. So you just kind of have to come to accept that life is going exactly as it's meant to go. Wherever you are, you are meant to be there. I am meant to be here. We may have come from a different place. We may be going in a different direction. In five years, maybe we'll be living somewhere else and we have a whole other life. But wherever you are, um, you know, whether again you're in blessing or netma, whatever the case, I mean, uh, tribulation, whatever the case is, you have to really come to that place that says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, nothing is done in vain. Everything has purpose and meaning. And I have to believe and trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only wants good for me. So even during the challenges and the difficulties, these are opportunities where I'm supposed to grow and evolve and become a better version of myself. I can't uh, start to turn away from, uh, from Allah. You know, just uh, to mention it, because I recently spoke to a sister who, it was hard to hear. You know, sometimes um, people go through different tests and iblis, uh, spiritual attacks are real. You know, if you if you ever are going through a difficulty in life and all of a sudden you find your mind riddled with these thoughts and ideas about, you know, Allah being angry with you and, you know, um, that you're cursed. And people do struggle with those types of thoughts because tribulations come and they can be so severe that you're trying to make sense of it. And sometimes Iblis is right there to interject, you know, in his way to take you to the worst and darkest conclusion, which is you're a horrible person. You deserve this. Um, because you're a cursed person. And so then the mind, you know, Iblis will just keep repeating those thoughts. And so people really struggle with, uh, with those ideas. And so you have to, you know, bring uh, some perspective. So anyway, I spoke to the sister and she had gone through a major loss. Um, and she was 
unfortunately convinced, and Iblis, of course, did this. It was, it was his, you know, thoughts that, that she was cursed. And she, she kept saying certain things. She said, uh, in one, a few times, she said that, I believe, uh, you know, Aldi Billah, like Allah is my enemy. I mean, she said that. It's very hard to hear a Muslim. She's a believer, but she had been under such a spiritual attack that she concluded that, you know, that, that he is on that, he's, he's torturing me or he's, uh, he's, he's angry with me and therefore I feel like he's my enemy. So anyway, we had to help her through that. But just to hear someone say that, you realize it's because we don't have context, we don't always have explanations for things. And it's hard, right, because we live in a world where most of the time, if, I mean, at least those of us who are privileged to be in situations where we can have, um, you know, uh, answer, questions answer, answered, right? For example, you, you get sick, you go to the hospital, you go to the doctor, and he, they can likely give you some idea of what's going on. So we're used to getting answers to questions. But when a big calamity happens and you don't have any idea why, then your mind starts to create those ideas. And that's why it's very important to zoom out and say, no, we're not meant to have the answers to all those questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally has limited our understanding in this lifetime. But he has promised that in the next life, inshallah, whatever questions you have, they will be answered. Just be patient and know that this isn't personal because if it was personal, then um, or if there was, you know, if, if this had something to do with your value, then how do you explain again the prophets and the saints and all the previous people of who were very close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? Very, um, I mean, they worshipped him, you know, beautifully and perfectly in many ways. How do you explain that they uh, were also tested? You know, because it's just the nature of dunya to be tested. So you have to, you know combat those uh, those negative ideas with that type of perspective. But um, in general, the way that you do that is just to practice this uh, rida with Allah, that no matter what's happening, I'm always content with Allah. I accept that everything is coming from Him and that there's good in it, and I just have to be patient. And then turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity, this is more proactivity, right? Like you have to be the one that knows what to do. So when things are going well, alhamdulillah, you're in a state of gratitude and dhikr, you're on top of your prayers. That's not a, a reason to suddenly forget Allah, because sometimes, again, we fall into those terrible habits where we look, we turn to Allah only in adversity, but we're supposed to be just constantly turning right that's just the you know the, the why worship is around the clock I mean from you know morning until night we have our prayers and then we have dua in between and we should we're encouraged to wake up even from our sleep to worship him so there's really no cessation of worship uh, it should be a constant thing and there's different forms of worship right there's ritual worship but then there's also acts like dhikr um, that you can do um, outside of those ti specific times. So turning to Allah is just a way of the believer. So those are the five foundations. And then he goes on, and again, it's kind of this interesting structure that he has of giving you kind of the building blocks of each of the, the sets that he's describing. So the five that we just covered, he says that the foundations of those are five as well. So exalted aspirations, maintaining Allah's reverence, expending oneself in excellent service of others, fulfilling one's resolves, and magnifying one's blessings. So if we want to get to that level of being, you know, on top of those first five foundations, these are the things we have to do. And then he goes further and says that in order to get to this second level, right, where you're actually able to even work towards those uh, initial five foundations, you have to have right conduct. And so the right conduct, he then helps us to uh, to know how to get there. So he says, you got to seek sacred knowledge, right, in order to fulfill Allah's commands. You can't have right conduct if you don't know what you're doing. It's very simple. It's pretty logical, right? You have to keep company with spiritual guides and fraternity uh, and the fraternity of aspirants to gain insight. So you need to surround yourself with people who are going to reflect the good that you want, as well as reflect in you things that maybe you need to work on, right? Because if you have you know, good companionship, they should be able to tell you, you know what, that you're going down the wrong path there. Don't do that. Don't make that mistake. That's not in your best interest. Um, that's real good company. If you have company that all they do is, uh, you know, shower you with compliments and, and make you feel amazing all the time without actually setting you right when you're going down the wrong path, 
they're good, they're good, but they're not as good as they could be. True companions want your salvation. They don't want you to just like them and love them. They want you to excel and they want you your salvation. They want you to be uh, saved in, in from this, you know, uh, I mean, in the next life as well. So those are the types of people you want to look for. And of course, the, the Prophet told us that al-mu'min al-mir'atul al-mu'min. So the believer is supposed to be a mirror for each other. So we're supposed to reflect light, but also truth. So look for that type of company. And then foregoing dispensations and interpretations concerning injunctions for one's own protection. So this is just a matter of taking your faith practice seriously and not looking for loopholes and trying to shortcut your faith. You know, sometimes the nafs, because it's lazy, it's the quality of the, na the, the nafs, right? And you should study the three degrees of the nafs, right? We have nafs. Nafs al amara bisu, which is the, the, the weakest of the nafus, it's the bottom tier, it's the nafs that's just immersed in sinfulness, it's given up basically, it doesn't do what it should be doing, and it is, um, it is uh, derelict in every which way, the nafs al amara bisu. It's uh, forgetful of Allah, it's heedless, it's sinful, so that's the lowest nafs. Then when you start to build a conscience and you have taqwa and you start to feel guilt and remorse for your sinfulness, you know, people have jahiliyyah and then they come out of jahiliyyah and they want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They want to do better. It's every day people like this exist. You know, they, they drink, they go clubbing, they're promiscuous and then all of a sudden they have an awakening and I want Allah. So then they enter the next phase, which is what we call the nafs al -lawama. And this is, the nafs al is the nafs that's uh, struggling against itself. It's going back and forth and back and forth. So between, uh, you know, righteousness and sinfulness. Because it's weak. It's finding its, you know, balance. It's hard when you're leaving bad habits, right? Especially if you've, you know, if they've developed over years or decades. To suddenly overnight turn a new leaf is not, I mean, some people can do it, mashallah. Some people have. They, they've definitely done it. Even people who have um, alcohol, uh, you know, addictions or drug addictions or, or smoking, they, there are those people. Cold turkey, they leave it, khalas. Allah can give people like that tawfiq. And with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything is possible. Because sometimes we think like, how could that happen? But if a person is truly sincere, and they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can absolutely turn their heart. You know, he's al-muqallib al qulub he, he changes the, the, a person's heart and then their, their actions follow. So that happens, but for the majority of people, they're going to struggle, right? Because the, it, the nafs is still, it's habituated to all that sinfulness, and then Iblis is calling us, right? Iblis, that's what he does, he tempts us. And sometimes those memories that are hard to, you know, get rid of, are, um, are the ones that, that beckon us the most, right? Because we recall a time where things seemed easier. I can just go drink my problems away. I could just go, you know, escape into this or that. So you find yourself, you know, drawn back to that. And then, of course, the conscience wakes up again and you feel horrible. So this con repeat cycle is the, 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 the state that a lot of us are stuck in. Uh, and this can also be in, with prayers, you know, there are people who get that boost of Iman and all of a sudden they're doing everything right and then you check in on them, um, uh, you know, maybe a couple weeks later and all of a sudden they're back in the slump. This is normal and as long as you're continuously moving toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're in a good state. So don't let shaitan make you feel like you're this perpetual failure, right, because that's the kind of ideas that people develop, like, oh, I'm, I'm such a loser, I keep failing. But keep moving forward, and inshallah, Allah will eventually, hopefully, get all of us to the highest state, which is the nafs al-mutma'inna. And this is the nafs that is stripped of all of those attachments. Like, you're done. You're done with the dunya. You've had the feast, right? And this is why, as you see people in their older age, because they've sold their sowed their wild oats, they've tasted the buffet of all the the things that dunya has to offer. They're done. And they're like khalas. I don't want it anymore. I've done it all. I've I've there's nothing exciting, there's nothing enticing anymore. And now that I've overcome all of that, I want something better and I'm starting to see, you know, the door of the other world is open for me. You know, this is why aging is also a big blessing. If you really think about, I mean, I know, alhamdulillah, I'm in my 40s. I am so grateful to be in this decade of my life because the insecurity, the doubts, the constant, you know, just 
not feeling ever settled of your 20s or teens, 20s, 30s, it just starts to kind of all go away and work itself out by the time you hit that beautiful age of 40. And then it's like you're coasting because you just start to see life um, very differently. You know, you st start to see the value of things. And you're like, yeah, well, oh my God, the time I wasted obsessing over this, that, or the other. I don't have that worry anymore. Now it's just Allah. That's all I seek. So that's, you know, the nafs al-mutma'inna is the nafs that's just stripped away of all that. It actually seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actively. A person who enters this state is, is free of uh, those sinful behaviors. I mean, they may make mistakes, obviously, we're human. But for the most part, they are, uh, you know, really, they found their rhythm and they're, they're mashallah, you know, doing well. And they're, they're really just working on bettering themselves. So this is a, an important part of our faith that we should understand. And when you're trying to discipline the nafs, it will bring you into a, a lazy state where it's looking for those shortcuts. So you want to be more disciplined in, in the stage of, of uh, you know, forming good habits. Be, be hard on yourself. That's how you, you, uh, um, you develop good habits. But if you start to get, you know, slack off and start to, you know, take it easy, too easy, then it's easier to slip. So, you know, that's the third point. And then he says, organizing one's time with the remembrance of Allah to maintain presence of heart. So we talked about that, the importance of really reframing your mind so that you're not wasting your time or, or treating uh, your time as though it could be wasted. Why is your time being wasted? What is it that you're doing, first of all, that is the waste of time? Or maybe you need to be, again, um, you know, choosing how to make the best use of your time. So it's in our hands, in other words. And that's why uh, trying to organize your time, uh, inshallah, is, um, is also mentioned here in terms of getting to that place where we want to be. And then the last part, he says, is suspecting the selfish soul the nafs in everything in order to free oneself from its whimsical desires and to be safe from destructive circumstances. This is very, very important. Um, the internal dialogue that we have, because it's familiar to us, it, it's hard to feel like uh, suspicion towards it. It's all we know. Think about your mind. Think about your thoughts. It doesn't occur to you to suddenly you know, question yourself. That sounds odd, right? But if you accept that there is a part of you, your nafs, your ego, that actually is your greatest enemy, if you accept that, then any thought that comes to you that is incongruent, right? It's incongruent with your faith. It's incongruent with what you know would be uh, most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should suspect it. Like, where did it come from? Because the source of our thoughts matters, you know, and I kind of was trying to imagine like an analogy for the mind and in terms of the stream of thoughts we get. And what came to me was like a grid, you know, you know, like in math, you, you, you have grids, right? So just imagine um, like even um, graph paper, right? If you look at graph paper, there's all these lines and it's little tiny squares, right? So, or like a traffic grid. A traffic grid would probably be the more uh, better, better analogy. But like your, our minds work like that. There's thoughts that are coming in from all directions, right? And some thoughts flow and they're, they're fine because they're good thoughts. You know, memories, uh, vikid obviously, anything that's a positive thought, when you have husn al of a person, you know, when you think of well of a person, you make dua for them, those are all beautiful thoughts, right? But then sometimes you get these crazy thoughts that come out of nowhere, and you're like, what is that, you know? Um, those thoughts you have to suspect, like where'd that come from, especially if it is, um, you know, a negative thought, a thought that is inappropriate, all of those thoughts, they have sources. Where, where are the sources of those thoughts? It's not always Iblis, right? Iblis is responsible for some of those bad thoughts that we get, but you can't blame Iblis for everything. Some of those thoughts emanate from you, and that's your ego. Your nafs, again, is your greatest enemy. So if you start to examine your thoughts more, you may find that there is a bit of a dialogue happening, and that's okay. It's okay to be like, wait a second, why am I thinking that, right? 
I'm reading a, a book right now, and in the book, the character, um, he's, he talks to himself. You know, and if you see people muttering to themselves, we immediately assume that they have a mental problem, right? Like you just see, I mean, obviously nowadays with AirPods, uh, you know, it's, it's not as difficult to see someone talking in the air and just conclude that they might have, you know, they might be on the phone. But if you just see someone without any devices and they're just pacing back and forth, but they're talking to themselves, Many of us would conclude, oh, that person's got a problem. There's something wrong with him. Um, so my point is that, you know, some people, they, they can't help but do that maybe externally. You know, they're, they're voicing this dialogue outside. But you could, we could certainly do that internally as well, which is, again, you get a thought, you get an idea to do something, or even you think about someone, um, or maybe there's an opportunity. Like if you're... Um, upset with someone, right? And there's a, an impulse in your mind that says, okay, I don't, uh, you know, I, I need to go apologize, right? Or no. And then you get a thought that says, no, they should apologize. Where do you think that thought came from? You had an inspiration to do something good, right? Maybe you felt motivated to get up and go, you know, reconcile and to try to bring harmony back into the relationship but immediately you're met with a thought that counters that thought where do you think that thought comes from it's not always iblis it's your nafs because your nafs feels entitled right we feel entitled like well why should i have to go apologize i'm always the one doing it and so then the nafs starts to feed feed you feed you and you become emboldened and now you're even more angrier than you were before a lot of that is internal dialogue. It's not external. So how do you discipline yourself or how do you have this where he's telling us to suspect the selfish soul? How do you do this? Practically speaking, you stop and you th examine these two independent thoughts. You say, subhanAllah, I was just about to do something good that I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be very pleased with me, right? When you break the ice, when you are the bigger person to apologize, even if you're the one wronged, I don't think we realize the amount of reward that that comes with. Because what you're saying, if you go back to the five spiritual, uh, I mean the five foundations, indifference to whether others accept or reject, that's really what it comes down to. When you're willing to overcome yourself, right, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's because you've freed yourself of the need to, feel, first of all, be right, right? Because you don't care to be right in front of other people, or it doesn't matter. None of that, all of that becomes trivial to you. Because what you are really looking at is, what will gain me the greatest reward with Allah? I'm not in this for this personal you know, benefit with this person. It's not a power play. Uh, I don't, it, none of that matters. What is going to garner the most reward from my creator? And if that means me stepping on my ego because we both are angry, we're both upset, the whole house is disrupted by this, but I can just stomp on my nuffs, go over there and say, hey, let's just work this out. I apologize. I know that there, that comes with such immense reward from Allah. And I'm doing that for the sake of Allah. So that's the kind of dialogue that you can have with your head if you were to just examine what is happening, what's actually occurring. So kind of zoom out and say, here I am in a situation, I'm not happy, this person's not happy, we're both in this negative state, and I had the desire momentarily to do something about it, but then immediately I, I had a, a, you know, another negative thought that thwarted me from that. So now I have two choices before me. The path is mind to take. What am I going to do? This is how you suspect the selfish soul. And if we could apply that, imagine, to every situation. And I know it's, it's a lot of work. It's not like we have all the free time to sit there and think about every thought. But when it comes to our relationships, this is important practice. Because all the problems that come to us, many of the problems that come to us, um, or the, that we're, we find ourselves in, are because of the nafs um, battling it out 
in, in relationships with other people, right? It could be your in-laws, it could be your siblings, it could be your spouse, it could be your children. But there's some, again, um, nafs battle happening, and we're not taking advantage of these opportunities to really fight within ourselves and do that mujahada. And from that mujahada, if you do it uh, enough, you will find ease. You will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making relationships actually much easier for you because you're preferring Him. Like your actions are saying, Ya Allah, I don't really care as long as you're happy with me. I'll stomp on my ego. I'll take it. I'll be wrong. I'll, you know, I won't have the last word, but I'm doing that for your sake. That's um, rising. That's rising above the nafs. So all of that. And then he goes on again, back to the document. He says that the um, pitfall of seeking knowledge. So now he's, he's kind of just breaking this down for us in terms of really looking at all of these actions that he's encouraging us to do, but also reminding us that it comes with some risk, right? So the pitfall of seeking knowledge is the company of sophomoric people. Uh, whether due to their age, intellect, or deficient religious practice. So, you know, when you're becoming a seeker of knowledge, you want to be careful. There are a lot of uh, people out there that don't have the best of intentions. They may misguide you. They may tell you uh, things that are not true. So you have to be aware that there's a responsibility on you to vet the people that you're learning from, making, sh making sure that, you know, that they have credentials, what citations are they sourcing from, like do that work, don't just be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go, you know, hang out with, with this group of people or that group of people just because they're religious doesn't mean necessarily that they are going to benefit you. There is um, still, uh, you know, s some uh, responsibility on you to, to do that work. So then he says the pitfall of keeping company with the spiritual guides and the fraternity is elitism. So if you're going to start to hang out with certain people, and this is the danger too of, um, of certain spiritual circles, is that once you become a member, right, of that elite group, of that special halaqa that meets hidden and there's like a membership required, all of a sudden you feel like you're better than everybody else, right? And this is very dangerous. So if you're a part of any effort, um, you get invited to certain, you know, people have private uh, events and you get invited and doors are open for you and you get treated differently that you don't fill your heart with a sense of superiority because that's not the, the benefit or that's not the purpose of having access to, to spiritual guides is not to be like, oh, I'm in the in crowd, right? Or I'm in the popular crowd or I'm in the cool crowd. That's, those are, you know, that, that's not the purpose. It's to benefit from their company. It's to be in their orbit. It's to watch them and observe them and absorb their knowledge and their wisdom and to model your behavior, not to just be part of a club, right? So elitism is a, unfortunately um, a, a real issue. Then he says the pitfall of foregoing dispensations and interpretations concerning injunctions is self-pity due to hardships. So you have to be aware that the nafs will fill you with ideas when you go the harder route that all oh, you poor thing right you poor thing it's, it's this is such a struggle for you so anticipate that as you are more in a, in a more sort of rigorous and disciplined um, path that you will start to also feel you know low in, in times because this is the nature of the nafs Right? It doesn't like discipline. The nafs doesn't want to wake up for tahajjud. You know, it's going to make you f feel like, oh, but you worked so hard the night before. Allah will understand. Or you start to, you know, don't do your sunnah prayers. It's okay. You can skip out. All of those, if you really um, push back, especially with our, with our sunnah prayers. I mean, I, I'm just speaking maybe from, uh, from experience. But I know because of, mashallah, th these, these types of works, that any time you start to pity yourself, and then you, you, uh, you know, you take off some of the practices that you've acquired as a means of like lessening your burden. That's nafs. Like if you if you've gotten to a really good habit, let let's say for example, you know you're, again praying all your prayers on time and doing sunnah and waking up for tahajjud, but then all of a sudden it occurs to you that you know what my sleep is off, I'm not feeling too great. And the next thing you know, you're starting to cut out certain things because you think like, I need, you know, I need uh, to take a break. 
the answer or the way to kind of assess whether or not that that's really what's going on or if it's just your nafs using uh, an opportunity to take away you know certain things that you were habituated to is to see where else your time is spent because if you're out shopping all day and you're doing a lot of other leisurely things and your body is being you know put to a test people go to the gym and they will happily spend hours hiking, going to the gym, spending a lot of time on beautification and all that. Um, and that doesn't seem to be a factor when it comes to their fatigue, right? Because they've m mentally accepted, well, that's for my health benefit. So then, then it's like, okay, well, what can I cut down with other things? And so if, if the first thought that comes to you is cut out your tahajjud, that's a problem. What's more valuable? In the grand scheme of things, hiking with your friends so that you can feel good that you got 10,000 steps in or waking up for the hajjad where your prayers are accepted. It's a beautiful time to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It opens this portal of this proximity, this closeness to him. And then just everything just brings so much ease and barakah to your day. What in the grand scheme of things is more important? But this is how the nafs will trick you, will delude you. So the pitfall of you know, being disciplined is that you're going to start to see these, uh, these uh, arguments that you, your mind will make for not doing certain things. But if you have a habit, hold on to that habit. If you're reading Quran every day, no matter what, look at it like this, I will never let this go. Because the moment you start to say, maybe I should do it every other day, guess what? You're going to start doing it every other day and then after that it's going to be maybe I should do it once a week and then check in a couple months later and are you even reading Quran? Nope. What happened? This is the khutuat of shaitan but also the nafs's way of taking in small doses things away from us. So that's um, a really important pitfall. And then he says the last one here the pitfall oh sorry the pitfall of organizing one's time with devotional works is ostentatious practice and ritualize perfunctory devotion. So this is also important too because if you start to organize your time, then you may fall into the disease of the heart where you want to do things for show. Ostentation is riya, right? So you want people to see you doing things because now it's like, ooh, if I have a choice between doing my prayers at home or going to the masjid and doing them so that everybody can see me doing them, and not to say obviously praying at the masjid is beautiful, but it's more paying attention to what's going on in terms of your mind. Why are you prioritizing certain actions over others? Is it really for the benefit of it, or is it that you're trying to, again, get more attention for certain things? And then the last one he says here is the pitfall of constantly suspecting the selfish soul is inclining towards its upright states and goodliness. Uh, and this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in the Quran chapter 6 verse 70, were he to offer every kind of compensation, it would not be accepted from him. And then there's more on that, but he says, moreover the noble son of the noble one, Yusuf the son of Yaqub, peace be upon him, both say in the Quran, I do not say the selfish soul was free from blame. The selfish soul indeed commands to evil acts, except for those on whom my Lord has mercy. So, you know, again, um, if you start to become completely... Uh, you know, where you're, you're, you're thinking of everything, uh, you know, b blaming everything on the nafs, then you may start to feel uh, like you're, you know, somehow, again, you've overcome it, and now you're, you're, you're this person who's just always on top of your nafs. No, your nafs is, even if you think that way, your nafs is deluding you. So it's something we have to, it's a mujahada. It's, it's something we're going to have to um, struggle with for until we leave this earth. So just kind of accepting that these are the, the states of the human being, that we have these uh, different sources of evil that make uh, our, our lives difficult, but we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if we have Him, we can overcome them. It's just a matter of practice. And really that's what Islam is. Islam is all about um, helping human beings become the best version of themselves through practice. Our, our deen is, is not just a belief. It's a way of life, and every aspect of our lives are, are covered when you really look at our worship, right? We have the physical, 
um, we're, with our prayers. It's a very physical act. You have to get up, wash yourself. I mean, I was thinking about, um, you know, wudu and, and subhanAllah. Just, it's, if you really think about how perfect Islam is, it's like subhanAllah, Allah, He really does, obviously, He knows us, but everything that He's, you know, asked us to do or, or, we're, or commanded to do is really, a, it's, it's so much to our benefit, right? Wudu is such a beautiful process because it's so um, unique to worship. Where else are you forced to cleanse yourself? You know, I mean, people, believe it or not, will go to like weddings, job interviews, places where maybe they're mixing and mingling with like, you know, um, elite people. They're, human beings are, you know, we can, we can become quite low and there are I'm sure people who are in the most foul states who will attend those things, you know. Uh, but this is a requirement Allah has of us that if you're going to worship me and you want to uh, converse with me, you need to be, requ you, you're required to be cleansed. <laughs> so I think it's just perfect. It's, it's beautiful. And then obviously the benefits that we get of the wudu itself. Um, so the prayer is very physical and then the mental preoccupation that gets a lot of people stuck into negative states we're taught how to liberate ourselves with, which is to be mindful, to practice dhikr, to read Qur'an. So we spend our, our time when we're not you know, doing work or other things, engaging the mind in beneficial things so that it doesn't have time to take us into you know, these dark pathways that a lot of people find themselves in, paths of you know, either stuck on something from the past, anxiety over the future. These are the things that take us away from the remembrance of Allah. But if we just, um, you know, again, put our faith into practice, we find that, subhanAllah, all of the things that trouble the human being, that make existence difficult for us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a way to overcome those things through our worship. So truly, truly, alhamdulillah, the ni'mat al-Islam. I mean, the amount of gratitude that we should feel, um, it should just overfill our hearts, right, for being Muslim. and. In this day and age especially where we see so much uh, misguidance and, and a lot of darkness, alhamdulillah, we have the light of Islam. So alhamdulillah, there's a lot more. And, you know, again, um, we'll continue, inshallah, with the next section, which are the foundations of what will cure the sicknesses of the soul. So that's really important too. Again, the document is written in this way where each uh, section builds upon the the one before it. So... This is, the next section is really how to overcome the nafs. Since the, the last point there was about suspecting the soul, uh, we, we need to learn better how to do that. So inshallah, we'll continue with that next month. But um, any questions before we break? I mean, I mean, no, it is difficult. Uh, we, it is difficult to remain steadfast. Um, but I think in my experience, one of the best ways to, to do it is to surround yourself with really good people who are also, who have the same goal. Because doing it on your own is difficult. You know, Islam was not, is not meant to do on your own. It's a, we're, we're a deen, uh, you know, it's a deen of jama'ah. And we're social creatures, Allah knows that. So that's why if you look, subhanAllah, what a gift that we pray together, we fast together, we hajj together, we umrah together, we do dhikr, we're supposed to do dhikr together. I mean, it's beautiful. So I agree, it's difficult if you're on your own. But if you find a good jama, inshallah, that keeps you accountable, it's much easier. So that would be, you know, and, and uh, just to mention it, because alhamdulillah, um, on the 10th of February, we're going to be doing a sister social here at MCC for the purpose of trying to help the sisters meet each other for this per, you know same intention we we you know we have halaqas here thursday and then on saturday i have a dhikr and dr rani of course does the friday night mashallah programs here uh, but a lot of times what i'm hearing from sisters in the community is that you're being talked at which obviously we're doing here too it's a class but we also need time to to just meet and connect and share and build forge really strong relationships and the masjid historically was always uh, a hub it was a hub for people to come together to do that so i invite all of you to sign up for that um that's going to be on february 10th it'll be a saturday evening inshallah and hopefully you'll meet more sisters yes assalamu alaikum how are you well, you're, you're very well thank you very much for gathering us together i really appreciate that
They're so sweet. And then, uh, You mean these sessions? Yes. Oh. Your presence. Oh. <laughs> presence. Oh, no. Was... Astaghfirullah. No, I'm sorry, sister. <laughs> Astaghfirullah. Wallahi, I, I, I'm so sorry if that's how it seems. Uh, first of all, thank you for your very sweet words. I, um, I, I feel like uh, maybe because of holiday and travel, I don't know, there were some gaps, but Wallahi, this community is my top priority. I really mean that. And if there's, no, I, I, I don't want anybody to think like I'm just flying all over the world. <laughs> I'm not. Inshallah, may Allah, you know, your niyyah is obviously very uh, pure. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you. It's a, it's a jihad. I know many sisters, uh, I hear this from many people, for, between Aisha and Fajr, that's very difficult for them for schedule reasons. So it's, sometimes it's logistics, sister. Like you have to maybe look at when are you sleeping? Are you getting enough sleep? Do you have good alarm system in your house? Like do you, if, you know, they have clocks now that have the other and you can blast it. And sometimes you might just need to order something like that where it's right there by your bed you can't ignore it you know so if you find out is it a logistic issue because it seems to me mashallah you want it you want it and you're asking for it but logistically you haven't figured out your what you what works for you so I think um, you know I had a sister I forgot the name of it but there are these adhan clocks she's very sweet she she gave it to me as a gift I love it it's every prayer mashallah you can hear it throughout the house so they're, they're uh, good systems, and maybe, inshallah, we can try to find that for you. You can order it, and it's, it's uh, set it up to all the times. Inshallah, that can be a game changer for you. And continued dua for you, of course. <laughs> Barakallah fiki. Yeah, yeah, sleep cycles, as uh, Sister Mubarak was saying, sometimes it's, you know, it depends on how much sleep we're getting. So the, the research uh, says that we hit REM, which is that deep sleep, within one and a half hours. So if you're sleeping within those, uh, you know, cycles, it's like you're getting, you know, maybe two, three, four, one and a half hour cycles, and you wake up, when a cycle is over, you'll be refreshed. But if, if you're not sleeping enough, first of all, and the event is going on, or the clock, if you have an alarm clock, but it's coming in that, one and a half hour time slot, you're in such a deep slumber that it's, it's difficult to wake up from that. So you have to kind of go back and say, I need to set my alarm clock to a time where I am getting enough sleep, but also that I'm not interrupting a, a REM cycle, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah, if you can do, yeah, if, if six hours, you know, as, uh, or seven and a half hours, but somewhere where it's like the alarm clock that you've set is, is coming at the end of a one and a half hour cycle, not in the middle of it, right? Because, yeah, that's where I think a lot of people don't realize it's, because it, I've, I've, I've had it too where you're like, how could I sleep through that? You know, it's so loud, but you can be in such a deep sleep, subhanAllah, that, you know, it, you're not hearing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Sometimes, yeah, you're dreaming of the alarm, but you're still not waking up. <laughs> yeah. Drinking a lot of water before you go to sleep. Yeah. That's true. That's the other trick too. Uh, the the only uh, issue with the, with that trick is that you're disrupting your uh, your sleep, so it, it becomes where you become very uh, groggy. But I have uh, definitely tried that as well. Where you drink, she, the sister was saying to drink water, and that kind of forces you to keep getting up. Um, but I think you know the alarm clock would probably be beneficial to you because I'm assuming, and you can correct me, were you raised hearing the adhan? Like, in a, were you, yeah, right? Yeah, so see, Allah, that would be so heartbreaking because if you were raised, imagine like you're, you're, you know, you're raised in a country or an environment where you were hearing that that was your alarm clock and then you're taken out of that. It's, it's like so painful for the heart. But alhamdulillah with technology, we can try our best. Inshallah, one day Allah subhanahu wa enables us to hear the adhan. That would be amazing. 
So we'll make a lot of dua for you, but thank you uh, for your lovely comments. And I just want to clarify that you know, the halaqas that I do here are once a month, uh, tw two of them though. We have the, fr the Thursday night one here for, you know, sisters who are working and they're busy and maybe they need to feed their families and then they can come. And then I have the Saturday morning for also sisters who can't come at night for whatever reason, but they just really need to just go out of the house and have some time for themselves. That's happening this Saturday. So I try to do them close to each other. Uh, just for, um, you know, uh, ease from, from me, honestly, for my schedule. But, uh, you know, if there's uh, other, we do have some, some other things in the works for Ramadan and afterwards. So, inshallah, you'll see more programming. <laughs> but, uh, come to, but come please to the Sisters Social. That, I think, will be um, really good. And I, I just want to clarify, too, that the events that we have here, it's so important that we see what I see here. Like, I love the multi-generational, like the multi-generations that I see. This makes me very happy because one of the problems that I think that we've really hurt as a community is where we feel like some programs are only for this demographic, you know, like, oh, moms of children only or women who are married only or women who are, you know, under this age or oh, I, I don't agree with that. That's not Islam. Uh, we have to have an open door where all generations all experiences feel welcome. I don't, it doesn't matter to me if you're married, if you're single, if you're divorced, uh, if you have never had kids. I don't care. If you're a believer and you're a sister, you're always welcome. So please let people know that because I feel like sometimes um, there are sisters who feel deterred. Like, oh, I don't want to come and bother, you know, that group. They're, they're, they're mostly this age range. No, if, if you're, uh, you know, a sister in this community, you're always welcome. So when we do the sister social, it sounds like, oh, it's this fun party kind of environment, but that's just a, uh, it's just a title. What it really is, is a gathering of the hearts and it's for everybody. So bring your mothers, bring your, you know, bring everybody, bring, you know, your, if your daughters who are 14 uh, and older, and bring people who are not in the masjid. You know, Sister Maha is not here, but Layla, you were here when she told us about, you know, the reason why we even started that is because she said that she knows, she told us 15 sisters in the San Ramon area who don't come to the masjid uh, because they feel like there's no programming for them. And then she said, which broke my heart, it really did. She said that five of them, they started going to, excuse me, church services because they felt like they were lonely, they're isolated, they don't have community, so we're just going to start attending churches for services. And I was like, what is happening? And then she said that five of them actually left Islam. So this is devastating to me. That, like we are, I don't know what we're doing, but like if we don't draw people back to our masjid and remind everyone that this is yours, this space is every one of ours. Nobody should feel like it only belongs to this group or that group. You're a believer. It's the house of Allah. It's for you. So I want that message to be heard loud and clear for everyone, that you're always welcome, inshallah, for the women. And even if you don't wear hijab, um, I doesn't, I don't, like there was a sister who came um, anyway, but she, she was worried that she wasn't going to be allowed in. She was a non-Muslim because she wasn't wearing hijab. I was like, astaghfirullah, what are we doing? So we have to really make sure that we're um, sending the right message to people, which is, you know, come, the masjid is for everybody who wants to be here. And our programs, inshallah, are, are there to serve. So I hope you come. And also, Sister Roya, mashallah, who's here, uh, she did a program here at the MCC. She'll be attending and hopefully leading um, an activity. So we're, we're trying to come up with a nice uh, event for people to really get to know each other. But I do hope you'll sign up, inshallah. Okay? And, yeah. Oh, that's right. And um, thank you for the reminder, everybody. You're so sweet. So Sunday, we have also the remosked event with Imam Ahmed Deeb uh, and his father, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdullah Deeb. And then I think there may be other panelists that were added. Um, but this was last week's event that got rescheduled. So all of these things are happening. Inshallah, you'll see me here on Saturday morning. We won't be in this room because they have the Boy Scouts event. So there's another room over there we're going to be in. So if you come on Saturday, um, it's actually on the other side where you go out the banquet. Uh, 10 o'clock to 11. And it's, it's just for, we'll read Quran, we do dhikr, we have a, a support circle. So that's available for all of you as well, inshallah. 
Yeah, we do Yasin, we do Dhikr, and then we just talk and make du'a for each other, inshallah. Try to be efficient <laughs> so that you have your Saturday with your families, inshallah. And then Sunday, okay? Alhamdulillah. So Jazakumullah khair and thank you, everybody. We're going to, inshallah, uh, finish with du'a. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد ولا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا thank you again everyone إن شاء الله Barakallah feekum.